six years old, and for the first time, I heard the words, a kupka. I'm Jeffrey Bryan Sauls. I am six years old. Sometimes we have meat, goat meat, gazelles. Elephant meat tastes rotten to me. <laughs> Giraffe is my favorite. This year we have a new thing in the freezer called TV dinners. <laughs> <laughs> They're little things. They have like applesauce and turkey and stuffing. And you pull them out of the, the oven. Oh, I thought it was fantastic. Really heartfelt, illuminating. Two souls who lived such different experiences to then to find a place where they could connect so deeply that they can call each other brother, is it's really inspiring. The attack came suddenly and a horribly. Explosion. Men on horses and camels chasing people. So we ran up toward the hills and into the arms of hell. It was not supposed to be this way. This is nothing at all like how we had planned. This is not the way it was supposed to go. So, I mean, we, we dare death. We use it as a tool to better know and enjoy our lives. But we know our stuff. We never fail. It's a game that we play and we never lose. We never lose. Never. To be invited in the journey through somebody's pain to the other side of it is just really heart opening. It's beautiful. It's poignant. And it's absolutely will affect me in my life, you know, and hopefully I can bring the same to others. Yes, this was masterful storytelling and brought us right into the lives of each of the young men. I didn't see it coming. I mean, I knew a little bit of background about the whole thing, but the way they weaved it in about these parallel lives and then boom, they're at the same table together. And so it opens us up to really feel what's going on and experience what's going on as well as processing it mentally, we feel it emotionally. When I first saw Aleppo's face, there was something about it that told me that this man was going to have an impact on a lot of people. The performance quality of Jeff Sauls, the way he commands the room as a theater person and theater creator, I was struck by his ability to own the room and own the space. The learning that I take away from, from the whole production, they're from radically different cultures, God knows radically different skin colors, radically different histories, but each of them clearly these are two individuals of character. It is manifest across cultures, manifest across skin colors, manifest across generations. As a matter of fact, we're going to take this thing on the road. Aleph and I are going to do some traveling. We're going to talk at churches and organizations and, and delicatessens. <laughs> you should see this young man eat a matzo ball. It's really impressive. I'm gonna go and eat some some elephant. I can't wait to get to Dinkland. Eat, my, eat me some giraffe. <laughs> yeah, giraffe meat is the mm, best. The best it's my favorite. <laughs> you gonna like the giraffe? I'm gonna meet on a giraffe leg. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. People walk around in sort of a a state of somnambulism. We all walk around half asleep, and then something happens. Like men come to your village in the night, riding camels and horses, shooting, setting fire. It tends to wake you up. You go off on a mountain and you lose your best friend, it tends to wake you up. So we don't tell these stories to get people to cry or to be upset, but to kind of wake up a sense of what really happens in life. Because from that deep sense of wakefulness comes an appreciation, comes a willingness to take risks, comes an appreciation for the, the brevity and the evanescence of life itself. So I think the fact that these stories are true, we offer them as a gift to help an audience begin to feel, to laugh and to cry and to walk away enriched and dedicated to making life a more fully lived experience. One day, a silver shape appears high in the blue sky and he tells me, there is another land and the people who live there are white. They like to live in the sky, and that is their big bird. The big bird is flown mostly by the American girls, he tells me. <laughs> they control it with their magic power, that is called education. 
I imagine these Americans with their magic power. And I think, I would like to cross the water and get there someday. We have a really dumb dog named Junior. <laughs> Junior's a dachshund, doesn't do anything except bite you. <laughs> you get too close to food especially. One time I got really close to my mom and she was making a turkey and Junior jumped up and he bit me on my stomach and he just hung there. <laughs> it really hurt, but mostly it was just weird. Imagine having a dachshund hanging from your stomach. <laughs> It is a play, we call it lecture theater, because Alefo Deng plays Alefo Deng, and I play myself. And so we are indeed bringing our actual stories. This is not based on a true story, this is a true story. And the way it works is, the play begins with his life in the Sudan, growing up in the 16th, 17th century. My life growing up in timeless New Jersey. Alefo surviving genocide, me surviving New Jersey, and how bit by bit, we find Alefo going through the civil war in Sudan. You find me climbing in South America. We find him coming to America where many of his real challenges began. And then you discover us coming together over a Thanksgiving table. So really our original thought of the play was, here's Alefo here, here's me here. And throughout the play, we had come closer until finally in the very last scene, we meet. And I think it's a pretty exciting moment where we meet for the first time and discover that these seemingly disparate realities converge in our humanity. And the lesson is that that's true for all of us. The seeming difference that we may possess really is nothing more than the diversity we, we have. And bringing that diversity together, find the commonality, we grow stronger and our lives become richer. The attack came suddenly and horribly. Men on horses and camels chasing people, shooting, screaming, crying. It was like the end of the world. I ran into the bush with the others to hide. Smoked, billowed out of our village and hung over it like a cloud. The roofs of the huts shot off in flames like torches. People scattered to escape the bullets. I watched as the invaders tied the arms and legs of their captives, putting long ropes around their necks. We little boys spewed out of the blazing village like colonies of ants. Disturbed in their nest, we ran in different directions, not knowing where we were going. Noel and I woke up pretty early. We threw some wood on the fire. We began to heat some water for coffee and porridge for the triumphant return of our heroes. Look, figures, figures approaching in the woods with backpacks. Here come the boys, yelled Noel. I knew something was wrong. Randy's eyes were wild, and he said, they must have fallen during the night. We found their bodies at the base of the couloir this morning. My heart pounded, turned into a fist. My chest, it, it filled with lead. I remember this sensation of like a balloon filling my body. I just said to myself, breathe, breathe. Breathe, and I tried to shut down my mind for the fear of darkness filling me completely. You have an indomitable spirit. You just say, I can live, I can survive, I can love. It's a good reminder that just to look up and come from your heart and you know, make that connection and what an impact that can make. What's happened has happened, but what, is, what do I want the future to look like and, and create it, make it happen. I think it did a magnificent job of putting that across. I expected something unexpected, and I got it. Let me tell you how it was. <laughs> I'm a bad boy here at Ralph's, and I must tell you, I am so overwhelmed. Machine is making that pooping sound. <laughs> it seemed like everyone has one of those cards that make you get things for free. <laughs> so when someone would take us out shopping or buy us lunch, we didn't think to say thank you. Later on, we realized these things were not free. And we learned to say thank you. 
In Dinka, you do not say thank you after everything, like you do here. So we had to learn. We remind each other in Dinka quietly. Remember to say thank you. Say thank you all the time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ralph gave us a three-day policy training. I understood nothing. I smile when I feel good. But it did not make sense to smile when I feel sad. So one day I asked Linda, does your face not get tired of smiling all day? I, I said, what happens if you are not in the mood to smile? She said, well, you're likely to lose your job. I don't want to get fired, because if you get fired from one job, you may never get another. So even now, when I feel sad or stressed, I have my teeth showing all the time. <laughs> People say, you have a great smile. And I said, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Excuse me, I have got to get back to work. <laughs> but I think the most amazing thing of all was our discovery that despite the different paths that we had traveled, and the different places we had come from, and the different circumstances that surrounded our journeys, our destination had turned out to be exactly the same. As a matter of fact, we found in the most important matters, there was not a single thing about which we disagreed. I believe the most transcendental experience that we can have as human beings is to find someone who ostensibly and visibly we have virtually nothing in common with and discover as we tell our stories and share deeply who we are and learn about that person, we discover that we are not only friends and brothers, but we are essentially in our heart of hearts and soul of souls the exact same individual. <laughs> And I think it began for me that very Thanksgiving. As a matter of fact, we were sitting at this table. Remember Although our journeys have been table? different, we've arrived at the same set of conclusions about what matters in life. And telling those stories to each other, we've been able to transcend the seeming differences and arrive at those places that we so profoundly have in common. And what is that that matters in life? Is, is, is building relationship. And what is a relationship? A relationship started with a conversation. What's a conversation? Conversation as a story. What's a story? A story is when you share from the bottom of your heart. What is unique is that we combine this theater piece, which really opens people up to their own stories by sharing our stories and how our friendship progressed through the telling of our stories. We then offer them a vision that we call the highest common denominator, which is how an organization can be run not along the lowest values, but along the highest values that people possess. And then we give them the skill set to allow them to tell stories in such a way that we make the 182nd guarantee that no matter the culture from which you come, if you find someone even as seeming different as imaginable, in 180 seconds using the skill set of the four touchstones in the hero's journey, you can create a, a connection. Dan Michelson, I'm the CEO of Strata Decision Technology, and I just got done bringing Jeff Sauls and Alefo Deng in to speak to our team. And it's really a moving story, uh, but really more a great lesson, and something that I would highly recommend anybody and everybody having that experience. The word company actually comes from the word compan, which is to share bread. And that a company is comprised of individuals who are making sharing bread together. But so very often, they become disparate groups of individuals seeking their own ends. We realize that when people can share their story in 180 seconds, is that it allows people to be more freer and having a human connections, connectiveness, connectiveness in experience, in spirit, in work. And I know that it's so much more fun to work at a place where people actually share a sense of camaraderie and joy. And it also makes that workplace so much more effective. So our goal in presenting the play and then the workshop is first to inspire people through the play to, to, to aspire to a deeper, higher level of living and then help folks communicate about that kind of connectivity to allow them to enjoy the workplace more 
and function more effectively as team members and leaders. Just heard Dr. Sauls and Alefo do their, their play. It was awesome. Everyone was engaged. They love it. I think our team is super pumped by their story. It was so motivating, and we look forward to having it. I work in our Champagne office, so I'm naturally distanced from most of the people here. Right. So it's harder for me to connect with people. So I think today will help me uh, be more open, disclose more, um, put myself out there. It was very inspirational, you guys, and I love the uh, matrix that you had between, you know, are you over here or over here? I thought that's very helpful and especially tied into our strength finders. I think it, it lets us connect to our really core measures, what we're trying to do with, you know, right here in America, this impacts the entire world. And, you know, bringing together a story like this really connects home. You know, we're doing the right things and we want to get on the right direction and really um, recognize kind of the meaning to the work that we're doing. So, really appreciate it. This was incredible. Akko Kao. Akko Kao is the magnificent reward that we receive when we do meaningful, important work in a company of those we love. This project for us has been Akko Kao. And we hope tonight we have been able to share this gift with you. We honor and appreciate your presence with us this evening. And now, go forth. Go forth and enjoy the sweet manna from heaven. Go forth and do the work the way the work wants to be done. Uh -huh.